in the audience. We thought it's kind of a symptomatic that we start to be a partner to a debate on an academic level, research level. And Stephen Downs is all of that and more. First of all, he is a researcher and academic in the sense that he truly creates new technologies. Some of them you might have them. He is way behind uh, something we call podcasts these days, because he started things like that uh, a long time before, as we talked uh, earlier, in the times where Second Life was hit or multi-user Dangans was hit. He even taught in multi-user Dangan environment, whatever it is, if you play role-playing games in computers that you might know. He did a lot of research in certain technologies for syndicating information, knowledge, academic knowledge. And yes, he did something that is called, that later on has been called MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses. Now everybody does MOOCs, but few of people ever do it like Stephen Downs and George Siemens did that. So connectivism is in the very beginning of MOOCs. And we might hear something about that, about technology, about uh, syndicating information, knowledge. So it's hard to give you an outline of what uh, else uh, Stephen Downs did. There was a nice talk, nice lecture in our conference, opening lecture, and it's going to be uh, placed in YouTube by the Creative Commons license, so you can see it, you can listen to it. But right now I'm handing a mic, actually metaphorically, because he already has one. <laughs> I'm uh, going to hand a board. Okay, the floor is yours. The floor is definitely yours. Right now, seven. Okay, um, let's have it started. <laughs> Quit playing with your computer and start, is what I'm saying. Okay. Sorry. Of course, my computer has stalled. Right when I'm starting, my computer decides to freeze. And I can't see it well enough because it's dark in here. Why, why, why? <laughs> I don't know why it won't work. Oh well, it's recording locally. I just can't see it, but I'll just have to make do. So, and there we go. I think that works. All right, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is the very first time I've done anything in a planetarium. So, and I wanted to record it, and my recorder is, is misbehaving, unfortunately. But uh, because I show the camera around here a little bit because nobody would believe me. So, <laughs> yes, folks, this is a planetarium. So, and I'm delighted, delighted to have been invited here to Warsaw and to, to be in this planetarium. Um, as you can see, the seminar topic is called Topics in Connectivism. It's not a single two hour long lecture. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm sure nobody wants that. Uh, I've got some topics, I've got four in fact that I can choose from. Um, but mostly I want it to be relatively informal and relaxed. Uh, like it, I, Lukas, is that pronounced correctly? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, S, C, Z, those are letters that I don't use normally. Uh, he has a microphone, and so you can uh, ask 
questions or make comments. There will be more mics even. Oh, there will be more mics even. So it's yeah. going to be distributed over the audience so we can ask questions whenever you, I mean, during the time of questions and answers. Oh. Is this going to work? Yay! Okay, so <laughs> now we're broadcasting on YouTube as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was busy trying to do. I don't always tell the organizers I'm going to do stuff like that, like <laughs> in this case. Um, but they've been so supportive of the whole concept of working openly and open inquiry. So I, um, the funny thing is I have not told anybody on the internet that I'll be broadcasting this live. So the average audience would be zero. <laughs> But that's okay. I don't mind that. Um, Lesek. I don't know. Lukas. I keep wanting to call you Lesek. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, Lukas uh, was talking about podcasting earlier. I ran a, a web radio station using a program called Shoutcast for many years. And the average listenership to my radio station was zero. And you might ask, why would I run a radio station if nobody is listening to it? And the answer, of course, is because I can. <laughs> um, and you know, it's not in the topic at all, but to me, that's what all of this stuff is about. You know, the, the connectivism, the internet, the online learning, is increasing our capacity to do things um, that we never imagined that we could. When I was a kid, not that long ago, there were what, eight radio stations, maybe, uh, and that was it. And you had to have millions of dollars to start up your own radio station. The very fact that I could have my own radio station, even if nobody listened to it, was for me a great thing. And so I would have one, because I could. So anyhow, um, for those of you watching online, which would be nobody, uh, I also forgot my uh, power adapter, so I'm running my computer on batteries. <laughs> So, I don't know how long this will last. It's a pretty good computer, um, but at the same time, the battery life could end at any point and the broadcast will stop. Sorry. So, I, I like to live a little bit on the edge. Maybe not that much on the edge. But. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's large. It's large. <laughs> I love this. Now, now I want to start a career making movies for planetariums. Um, so this is a lot of fun already. So we've got about two hours, maybe a bit less now, what just tells me. So I've got three hours of material. Um, but I'm not going to worry about covering the material because that has never been important to me. I'm going to start talking about some topics, but I want all of you, and I'll try to remember you guys here, there's not many of you, but you're on the other side. Um, you know, as I go through, I want you to feel free at any time to ask a question or make a com comment. Uh, Lucas will be watching you at all times. He doesn't know that yet. Uh, and, um, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and also, too, I will build in time to, to reflect and, and have questions or dialogue or whatever. I want this to be for all of you who have taken the time out of your day to come and, and see this. So if you have questions, if you have comments or opinions, or you want to call me 
crazy or mad or whatever, uh, this is your chance to do that. And I would certainly encourage you to do that. I just realized on my video broadcast, because I have no light on me, every once in a while this hulking shadow appears on the screen. So, and also the screen goes off because I'm on battery power. So, you yeah, have to watch for that. So, if you're watching this on video, yeah, that, that shadow is me. Actually, I have a little... Uh, uh, I'm not going to find it fast. See, this works really well if you find it right away. If you don't find it right away, it doesn't work at all. Oh well. I have, so a little, I have a little tiny flashlight in there. We might find it later on so we can yeah. start right now and yeah. then go. Yeah. Well, this is just getting impatient. <laughs> all right. First topic open networks. So. Wow, this is so big. Uh, so this is what I'm working on now. These are the various projects that I have on the go. Um, so a couple of them aren't really available to show anybody yet. E-learning landscape and future of learning project. I've got a big paper coming out uh, in collaboration with Contact North in about two months time on the future of online learning. So I'll, I'll encourage you to watch for that. What's really interesting is I've, I've done some review work, for example, with the Canada School of Public Service. This is the organization that trains all of our government employees. And they're adopting things like social networking and resource libraries and performance support. All of these new technologies, for example, that we've been talking about so far. Um, as well, something called competencies and skills system. This is a project by the United States Advanced Distributed Learning on how to manage competencies. It's part of what they call total learning architecture, which sounds probably worse than it is. Um, but the idea is to create an overall environment where people learn and where what they learn can be recorded in such a way that it can be used for learning analytics and other tools. It's pretty interesting, it's really technical. It's something I'm just keeping up with. MOOCs, I still do MOOCs. I've got a MOOC coming up sometime this fall, but also uh, I've been working on a site. I plan to just click the link and show you, but I can't really do that, I guess, in this environment. Um, but if you go to mooc.ca some point, I can show you on my phone, but I probably shouldn't do that. Um, but it's a site that lists all of the MOOCs that there are, and so you can search for different MOOCs that you might be interested in, just go straight to it. It's not the first one in the world to do that. There's Class Central uh, that does that uh, as well, actually does it better than this site does. But what I'm trying to do with this site is set it up in such a way that the content is open. So you don't have to use MOOC.ca to find MOOCs. You can access the programming interface and write your own software that brings the content straight into your own application. The idea is that it's a part of a network. Um, the main thing I'm working on is Grasshopper, which is a tool for a personal learning environment. And Grasshopper is the practical application of a lot of the theory that I've been talking about, that I talked about last week, and that I'm talking about this week. These slides, by the way, will all be available on my website. So I can't click on the links here, but you can click on the links later after this, uh, this talk. So let me talk about MOOCs for a little bit. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. To me, the really important part of that is the word open, 
people have focused on the massive part, and yes, they can be massive, but I'm more interested in the idea that these courses can be open. And by that, what I mean is that the content, the teaching, etc., in the course can be accessed for free by anybody around the world with an internet connection. So what's key about this is creating an environment where people can get resources on any number of different topics to allow them to manage their own learning. So there's the top site there it's, uh, called the True History of the MOOC is the story of the first, I don't know, eight or ten MOOCs that were created. My own, uh, the ones we did with George Siemens, the MOOCs that Jim Groom did with uh, DS106. He did a series of them on, dis on digital storytelling and a bunch of others. Um, our MOOCs, as, as Lucas mentioned, are in the minority. Most people who did MOOCs, who created MOOCs, and now there are some 10,000 different courses online in this format, created what are called X MOOCs. The difference between our MOOCs and their MOOCs is that our MOOC was structured as a network or as an online community where the focus was on interactivity between the participants. Whereas the X MOOCs were organized in a more traditional sense where the focus was on the content. And so it was a, they were arranged in a linear fashion. You go through chapter one, chapter two, etc., like a book or like a course. And every once in a while, you would have exercises and tests. So they've proven to be popular. They're not exactly how I would do MOOCs. But what the two types of MOOCs have in common is this idea of open content. And I think open content in the long run is going to be the most important part of the MOOC. Here's the concept. Now, this is not just me. This is a bunch of people, including me, who are interested in this idea. Right now, the services that we have on the internet, things like Facebook, things like Twitter, and the services that we have for educational technology, things like Please don't die, computer. Uh, things like uh, the learning management system, for example, um, or even the centralized repository of resources or academic articles. What they have in common is that they are centralized. There's a single website, and everybody goes to that website. If you want to take part in a Facebook discussion, you have to go to Facebook. A lot of people find that there are problems with this model. One of the problems is that the algorithm that Facebook uses becomes very important because everybody has to use the same algorithm to determine what they're going to see, what they're not going to see. If there's a point of failure in Facebook, the entire network goes down. It's not stable. If you control the network, you control the entire network. And a centralized service like this is very expensive and therefore depends on a lot of funding. In the case of Facebook and Twitter, on advertising and on selling your personal data. The result is people do not get the social networks that they want. People do not get the learning management system that they want. So there are various projects designed to create distributed networks. These are some examples. Opera Unite. Opera is a web browser. And for a while, this project concluded unsuccessfully. For a while, the web browser had a server in it. So anybody who was on the internet using Opera could also have a server as well as a browser. 
That was really cumbersome. Diaspora, it's the third one listed, was, well, it still is, a distributed social network. And what that means is it was constructed very similar to Facebook or Twitter, but instead of there being a single server, there are multiple servers that individuals can have. So instead of you depending on some service provider for your social network, you can run and host your own your, your own branch or your own node of that social network. That's a model that's also used by Solid. Solid is a project that's currently being worked on at MIT by Tim Berners-Lee. You may have heard of him. He's the guy who invented the web. He looked at the web and said, this web is broken. <laughs> and so he and a team of people have been working on Solid which stands for social linked data, to try to create the distributed fixed version of the web. Also, there's a thing called the interplanetary file system. The best thing about that is the name. Um, but the idea is that for any file, any document, like say these slides, you upload that to your website, but then other people can access that and upload it to their sites. So a single file might be distributed across a hundred or a thousand nodes on the internet. So it never goes away and it's always accessible. If my website goes down, somebody else's website steps up and offers it for people. It's a different shape for the internet and it's being based on different technologies. I choose to focus on cloud technologies because more and more these are really important technologies that are, that are all being developed in the background. Um, frankly, if you weren't watching for them, you wouldn't even know that they exist. Uh, I mentioned the XMOOCs earlier. The big innovation that they used at Stanford University for their course was to use something called, and is it there? Yes, Docker as a provisioner for their course. And what Docker does is it allows them to scale up this course um, as rapidly as required. So when they got 150,000 people subscribing to their course, because they used cloud technology, they just added more servers and more databases and more processors as was needed. There's a whole infrastructure around that idea. We have Docker and Vagrant. We have providers like Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft Server. There's uh, IBM Bluehost, I think they're called, I forget, um, and one or two others. And ultimately, the idea that we're being led to, especially in the field of learning technology, is the idea of the serverless content management system. So that if I wanted to have a learning management system or a piece of educational technology, I don't set up a web server like a typical website. Instead, I write my, my code, my web pages, and then I use different cloud service providers to host different parts of my application. If you think about it, this is a revolutionary concept. The website itself isn't a single thing. It is distributed. It actually exists in many different places across many different services. So I have a website. There might be some video on the website, but that's coming from YouTube. There might be a discussion board coming from the website, but that's hosted by Yahoo. I have a comment area that's hosted by Discus. I have some analytics. So if somebody logs onto my site and I want to detect what they're looking for, I have some analytics that's being run on the cloud at IBM Bluehost, etc. 
So the one site is being hosted in half a dozen different places around the world. All of these services are interconnected. I talked last week about connected networks, and it sounded all airy and theoretical. But the web itself, individual applications on the World Wide Web are being built that way now with these distributed but interlinked technologies. If you're involved in web design or instructional technology or any of these areas, if you're not familiar with these technologies, this is where you should begin to look. And I, my advice would be go to this slide, follow those links. And I say that now I'm about to change the slide. How are we doing so far? Interesting? This, okay. Well, I, it's hard to see because it's dark. All the techno freaks are now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so much better than the, the theoretical stuff. So, another aspect of learning, we were talking about this earlier, immersive reality. Um, there's been a lot of press on this, so I'm not going to linger on this too much. But, oh yeah. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on the technology, much less emphasis on the key element of immersive reality, and that element is belief. I mean, that's what makes the real world a real world. That's why they, that's why they go to all the time and expense of this. They want you to believe that you're in the cosmos. Hey, I get to do this. <laughs> um, that's what the technology is for, is to create this belief. Um, there are going to be a bunch of different ways of doing it. Uh, Multimodal, so there will be the cognitive and the kinesthetic aspect. You'll have sensors that vibrate, you'll have worlds that move around. But what's really interesting in the long run will be the social and networked application of this. When I started working in this field, I started working on what were called multi-user dungeons, or MUDs. And what these were, this was back in the 1980s, these were text-based multi-user environments where we played games. Because that's the best use of the internet, is to play games. The second best use of the internet is for teaching, and that's what we did next. So we used these text-based multi-user worlds to set up classes, to set up simulations, and so on. And over time, these have developed, well, there are some uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, things like World of Warcraft and EVE. But in the world of learning, it remains a challenge but one that people are working on, to have multi-user simulated environments. Um, you should, uh, every once in a while I work with the Canadian military and some of their projects, and you should see their eyes light up when you talk about how the, the ground, the people who are doing the infantry simulation could be connected with the people who are doing the Air Force simulation and all of that, and they say, oh, we could build this whole in, entire simulated battlefield. And, okay, that's probably not the best and most peaceful use of internet technology, but the same concept could be used, you know, right now they're, they're having a hurricane in um, Houston, in Texas, and if only they had been able to rehearse that with a simulated uh, hurricane before the actual hurricane happened. So they could manage all their communications and have that all planned ahead of time. That's the sort of thing that people would like to be able to do. But said, uh, while this is interesting, it's what I, what I call niche. Uh, it's useful in certain specific areas where suspension of disbelief and putting yourself into an immersive environment will be useful. But most of the time, 
you're going to need something that's a lot more immediate and a lot less immersive. If you are flying an aircraft, for example, and you need learning support, you don't have time to put the airplane on hold and go into a simulation. So, to me, where all this leads is in the direction of personal learning environments. And this is where I've put my mental energy over the last five or six years. Not always with success. This is a hard concept. And it, it's hard to build and it's hard to get people to believe in it. So maybe this will never be successful. But I, I personally, I think that this is where technology, learning technology especially, is headed. The idea of the personal learning environment, you see it in the picture there, is that an individual person is at the center and they are connected to a network of services and resources and, importantly, other people. And so you see this person here, they're connected to Edutopia, ResearchGate, and other resource sites. They're connected to Facebook because they have to, Blogger, Twitter. They're connected to Merlot, which is a library of learning resources. They're connected to TED because everyone loves TED except me. Uh, they're connected to LinkedIn when they can make their passwords work. They're connected to Eureka Alert, which I don't know what it is, but they're connected to it. And to Dr. Burns and Brandon and Dr. Page, because those are their doctors, etc. And the thing with a personal learning environment is it's different for each person. That's what makes it personal. You have your environment and you have your resources about the subjects that are interesting to you. So some of the work on this, uh, the uh, you need resources. So I've been working on technology called Resource Repository Network. The work that I'm doing with MOOC.ca, that's part of that work. Also as well, what you need is what might be called a personal cloud. Again, right, they said everything's in the cloud, right? This means your data, your computer will be to a large degree in the cloud. I've got a really good computer here, but it's only got one terabyte of memory. <laughs> it's only got one byte. But so I use um, Microsoft uh, OneDrive, I use Google Drive, I use Dropbox, I use a bunch of different cloud uh, services. I use Flickr because I have 40,000 pictures. I don't want to put 40,000 pictures on my computer. So I put them on Flickr in the cloud. YouTube for my videos, SoundCloud for my audio, etc. And that will become more and more prevalent over time. It doesn't make sense to buy extra storage media when we can simply put our stuff in the cloud and share it with everyone. That's also what we'll do with our personal learning records. My employer, according to my employer, in the last 15 years of employment with them, I have taken one course. Uh, that's clearly wrong, but it's wrong because they have no way of keeping track of the learning that I've undertaken over the last 15 years. What I want, and this is me wanting this, is my own record of all of my academic achievements that I have that I can share with my employer or my next employer or with people who want to bring me to countries to give talks or whatever. I share all my presentations on my website. Why can't I share my learning achievements? Uh, it, you know, my, my degrees, my certificates, the courses that I've taken, the badges that I've received, etc. So that's going to be an important part of any learning environment of the future of one sort or another is the personal learning record. Maybe a personal learning assistance as well. Um, I don't use any of them yet, uh, but there's Siri, uh, there's Cortana on this thing, which won't shut up. Um, 
he keeps trying to get me into a conversation. I'm not going to do that because I'm not like that with my computer. Uh, there's um, so Siri, Cortana, Alexa, and and what are the others? I forget the others. I guess so the idea is that. Your computer will be your constant, supportive, helpful person. I have uh, the Google Assistant on this. I guess it's just Google. It keeps telling me to take, you know, when I'm in this building, it says, you're in a very popular place. Google thinks this place is popular. You should be happy. Uh, take some pictures and upload them. It doesn't even say please. It just says, take some pictures and upload them. Uh, that's Google being helpful. Like, Telling me how I can be famous. So, but, 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 it's early days, right? Um, a computer equipped with artificial intelligence based on narrow networks with access to all of your resources might actually be useful. So why don't, why don't I, I pause for a sec? and uh, see what you think about that. Any questions? Jakieś pytania? Chętnie podzielę się tym mikrofonem z każdym. Pewnie mamy jeszcze jakiś mikrofon, który możemy przekazać na drugą stronę sali, bo pewnie też są więcej chętni do zadania pytania. Słuchajcie. Seminarium. Seminarium jest zazwyczaj dwustronne i interaktywne. It's not really a seminar room, is it? <laughs> o, mamy pytanie. Na każdym zebraniu jest tak, że ktoś musi zacząć. Okay, so because you mentioned this XMOOCs and CMOOCs, yes. and you said that your courses were CMOOCs, so they were related to community. I was wondering, have you ever checked what is the level of involvement of people in XMOOCs and CMOOCs? Because usually, as far as our experience uh, show, a lot of people start MOOCs mm -hmm. and then. Uh, at the end of the day, there are only few who really finish the course. So I was wondering, is this community-based approach helps to keep people on track? That's an interesting question. And there's a couple of things going on in that question. Um, it's, and so I will answer it, but I want to challenge immediately the presumption that finishing the course is a good thing. And you might think, sacrilege. Um, but, you know, most of your experiences are like that. Uh, if you read a newspaper, do you consider it a failure if you put the newspaper aside before reading every single article in the newspaper? Clearly not, right? It serves its purpose if you pick and choose the articles you want to read and discard the rest. If you go to a restaurant and do not eat everything on the menu, has the restaurant failed? Well, no. <laughs> In fact, it would be insane to do that. If you go to a, a football game in your beautiful stadium on the other side of the river and you do not watch every player all the time, did you not get your money's worth? No, you, you, you follow the ball just like everyone else. So we have this idea that a course is different from all the other stuff that we do. We have this idea that a course is like a book, where if we start it and don't finish, maybe the book is a failure, unless it's a dictionary, in which case we don't want to read start to finish. Oh, well, I will say, as a kid, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's got a lot of great content, but the plot's a bit thin. And character development, Anyhow, um, the difference between a CMOOC and an XMOOC is in the CMOOC, it's like a newspaper. It's like a restaurant menu. It's like a football game. It's like life. 
you pick and choose, and you'll finish eventually. But you know, there's no set schedule. Um, you know, it's not a failure if you don't do everything. So, to me, involvement and engagement in a MOOC is measured by criteria other than did they finish. And for that matter, even with an X MOOC, it should be not just did they finish, but did they learn something? Did they get something out of the course? So, um, I agree with your assessment of the research, which is that for the vast majority of MOOCs, most people do not finish. Um, even our C MOOCs, uh, the number of people participating at the end is less than the number of people participating at the beginning. Although our retention rate is something like 10 times what the X MOOC retention rate is. There is a lot more retention in ours. Um, the measurements we use are not simply, did you log on? Um, I actually, well, every web server has a log, but I actually never actually looked at that log. Uh, I was more interested in the activity and in the participation. We had newsletter subscriptions, and in our MOOC, and this is consistent with the other courses, but in our MOOC of 2,200 people, we had 1,700 subscriptions at the start and 1,800 subscriptions at the end. So they stayed subscribed for what that's worth. Uh, for the participating blog posts, we had 170 at the start, we had 170 at the end. Or not blog posts, but individual blogs. The number of individual posts per blog dropped off quite a bit. But they stayed connected to the course. So that's kind of about right. A participation in our live sessions. The first week we had something like 200 people. And then we stabilized around 30 or 40 people for the rest of the course. That stayed constant. And actually that's been true of all of our MOOCs. Uh, the live sessions the, you know, the, on our radio station that normally has zero listeners. Um, we get about 30 to 40 people. Some of the less popular MOOCs later on, we, we'd have about 15 people, but that number would stay stable throughout the whole course. Of course, 15 people. Now we're not really talking massive anymore, but that's the way it went. So, you know, there's, there's different ways of measuring participation. But here's another thing. We launched our MOOC in 2008, our first MOOC. The community that was created still exists. And, you know, and some of them have published papers. Uh, a number of them have gone on to receive higher degrees. They're all, well, not all, but many of them are doing stuff. I know they keep in touch with each other uh, and with us. Uh, they follow each other and us on Twitter. There's a bunch of them that are in Mastodon, which is a new social, a distributed social network. Um, that we ran into first in 2008. Um, the second year we taught the, the connectivism MOOC, the people who took it, well, this, a good number of them, came back and took the second one uh, and started to teach it. I don't know how you measure that as participation. You know, can you imagine a university where last year's geography class came and started to teach this year's geography class. That was very strange. So, well, I interrupt. It happens all the time before the exam. The, the last year students will teach the first year really? students. Yeah, that happens all the time. Oh. It's just the background because that's community, yeah. is not, that's community is not measured by university as a yeah. teaching and learning report. Yeah, I, that didn't happen in my experience, although I, I guess I heard the fraternities did that, but I never got that benefit. I had to figure it out myself. Any other questions? 
I'll take a liberty because uh, to play up the game you started with this uh, response because what you have here in the middle of the slide is personal learning record yeah. and that's the point if you don't measure participants by the in and out like university for example with exams okay how do you measure learning record in a connectivist yeah. way well <laughs> that's two separate questions <laughs> All right, you see there where it says XAPI. That stands for Experience API or Experience Application Programming Interface. Now, it's a big name for a very simple concept. The concept is every time you undertake an activity, a record is written in your learning record store in the XAPI format. The X API format is a simple sentence. Fred read Moby Dick. And actually, with X API, it's probably Fred read Moby Dick page one. Fred read Moby Dick page two. Fred read Moby Dick page three. It's very boring reading. Um, and it records everything. Fred answered C. Uh, on question two, Fred answered D and was wrong. Okay, now, so the idea is you have these very simple sentences describing your activities. And then you have artificial intelligence, analytics engines more precisely, looking at the vast bulk of that and saying, Fred is passing or Fred is failing or whatever. That's what they're up to. Now, me, I'm a little bit, thank you. One of the great things about any of my lectures or talks or seminars, you can leave. Um, so, and I don't feel insulted, it's okay. That's, that's, the, that's anyhow, that's a whole separate topic. Um, I wrote a, a small little article once where I said people should be measured not according to what they got, not according to the grades they got, or the result they got, or even the thing they did to read something or consume something or attend a class. I've always felt that people should be uh, graded according to what they share. And so for me, what your learning record is, most of all, is the record of the things that you've created or contributed to the network. Uh, the posts that you've made, uh, the drawings, the videos, maybe the games you've written, the software you've authored, the reviews of things that you've done, uh, the answers that you've given to questions, all of those things combined, I think, form a, a far better representation of a person's capacity than test grades or attendance in class. And so I think all of those, you know, ought to be made available at the person's choice, of course, but ought to be available on their website. And that's the example that I try to set with the work that I've done. All my presentations, including this one, audio and sometimes video, if the video for this works with the big hulking dark shape, which is me, uh, that'll be available. All the articles I've written for different discussion boards or mailing lists, I make those available. All of my newsletters, anything I create, I make available. And people are able to look at that and judge for themselves, um, do I know what I'm talking about or not? You know, so I don't depend on, uh, well, I, I was gonna say, I don't depend on degrees or certificates, which isn't completely true, I do have degrees, but your assessment of what I know 
would not and should not be based on the assessments of this piece of paper because a person could do as much without that piece of paper. So, and, and you might think, and, and I would agree, it's too much for any of you to read all of my stuff. So, down the line, in the future, we will have the capacity to access analytics, artificial intelligence, that will look at thousands, hundreds of thousands of individual people's records out there on the internet and find the one person who knows everything about frauds or find the two people who have the most coherent understanding of how to manage floods or whatever by what they've contributed to society. And our understanding of achievement will be like that rather than by courses or certificates. Any other questions someone would like to participate, share, comments, reflection? Perfect. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'm afraid uh, you aren't broadcasting right now. Uh, we were trying to find you. <laughs> it's, it's not going out. <laughs> and if you're an additional audience member, uh, we failed. Uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, at least I'm recording locally, so. okay. although it's low quality video. Okay, that, that's great. Okay, and um, no. when we are talking about all of this stuff, um, I've got this connection in my head mm -hmm. uh, between uh, blockchain and semantic web. And uh, maybe you could tell us something more because I'm not enough brave to try to explain uh, semantic web. So you are the right person to do it. Okay, it's, um, I love this, off the top of your head, what is the semantic web? See, this is, this is where you get to prove, what, do you know this stuff? So, no, no, it's fine, I just, uh, it's, it's an interesting challenge. The semantic web is the representation of knowledge in a structured form. The structured form is XML, which is just a coding language. And the idea of the semantic web is that statements are expressed in this language which assert facts. For example, um, Paris is the capital of France. Uh, Steve Jobs is the CEO of Apple, etc. Very simple statement. Um, they're, they're written in the form of what are called triples. Um, although sometimes they can be just two parts. But typically they're three parts. So Steve Jobs is the president of Apple. Subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. So, big deal, you might say. The thing with the semantic web, though, is that anything can be a resource in the semantic web. So, Steve Jobs can be a resource. Apple can be a resource. Uh, that coffee cup can be a resource. Uh, Lucas can be a resource. His hat can be a resource but only if it has its own website. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but the idea is that every entity in the semantic web, subject, verb, object, actually refers to a distinct entity with an address. So it's subject pointed to here, verb pointed to here, object pointed to here. So this hat, if it's on the semantic web, literally has a website. So here's the hat, here's the website, and now I have a statement, Lucas, there, wears his hat, there. Make sense? So that's, that's the first part of it. All of your stuff has its own websites. And then the vocabulary we use, 
wares, for example. There's no thing to point to for wares. So there's a vocabulary of what wares means. So we, we keep it in a list of terms, which we'll call a schema. And so if I use a word like wares, I'll point to it in the schema. And the idea was that I could use one kind of vocabulary to express one kind of thing, another vocabulary to express another kind of thing. So it's you have the basic XML to make statements, and then your vocabularies for specific statements, and then your references that links everything together. And that's the two-minute description of the semantic web. Does that make sense? Now, here's why it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong because it presupposes that all the cognition that we want to do can be done in a formal representative language. That the entire world can be described in propositions like Lucas wears his hat. Okay, I'm fine with that explanation. Any other specific comments or question? We may then move to another part. Let me say one more thing. Yeah, come on. Because, I'm sorry, it's just you introduced it by saying there's a similarity between when I was talking about blogs and the semantic web. The similarity is they both create networks. The, the web of linked data is a network, um, and a really interesting network, just in the way that the blogosphere network, or a personal network, or a social network is a network. So they have a lot of properties in common. Sorry. Okay, so now, do we need a break, like five minutes, or can we go further? How do you, what do you think? Go on? Yeah. This is Yes, this is the experience or audience. So we can <laughs> switch to the next topic you have. All right. Just to record, the time is five past five, so we have like fifty-five minutes. All right. Well, let's see what's uh, see. Like I got three hours of slides, and I've covered ten minutes. Of them, so but let's see what we got here. Oh, let me linger on this for a second. Uh, what I really, no, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> that, that's a whole. Now let's move on to the next topic. Whoops, too far. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is good. This, 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 that's a guy I saw in Krakow. He made very good music. Because I showed this to someone, they said, oh, yeah, I recognize this. It's kind of funny because I never would have recognized either who he was or where he was, but they, they say, oh yeah, I know exactly where he is. It's a funny thing. Personal learning. So, given everything I've said, everything I've said Friday about networks, everything I've said here so far, we get I think a pretty substantial change in the paradigm or the way we see the very enterprise of education. And I like to use the analogy of the distinction between a path and an environment to draw that distinction. This ties in really closely to the question about, you know, do people finish a course, right? You, you would finish a path, but you can't finish a field. Well, unless you're a farmer. But I mean, normally, you don't finish a field. There's always an exception to every rule. So, if you think about it, on the side of the path, we have the, the traditional course. But on the side of this field, we have I don't like the word curriculum there, but I like the word topic or discipline or subject 
or community of practitioners or field. Well, I really like fields there. On the side of the traditional course, there's this sense of a sequence and the sense of you have to do one thing before you do the next thing, before you do the next thing. Lucas was asking beforehand, and he meant it nicely. He said, is your presentation in a logical order? So I looked at him and said, yes, look at who you're talking to. Um, so the answer is no, it's more the field than the path. It's more the field than the path. It's still logical, but it's not logical in that way, right? It doesn't go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Any of these slides I could do a whole talk on, or I could do two minutes on. Um, in a traditional course, we think of content that has been covered. You get that, right? Did you cover this subject? Did you cover that subject? But in the idea of the field, it's more like inquiry, discovery. There may be gaps, but there isn't the sense of, of coverage in the same way. The gaps aren't necessarily bad things. They just represent what you've chosen to focus on and what you haven't chosen to focus on. Anyone who's in the sciences understands that, right? If somebody's a physicist, you cannot know all of physics. You have to focus. You have to pick the areas of the field that you'll focus on. There are going to be gaps, and they will be covered by other people. It's interesting. The, the depiction of knowledge as a path also has built into it this whole sense of competitiveness. There's a ranking, there's an ordering, it's like a race, there's positioning, there's first in your class, bottom of the class, front of the class, etc. In the idea of a field as, or as a course as a field, you get a different sense. You get grouping or clustering phenomena or behavior rather than a linear order of best to worst. People move together in clusters rather than competing against each other on a race course. In the traditional model of learning, there's this sense that there's this objective that you're trying to get to. Everybody is trying to get to the same objective. In, in traditional courses, your course or your module will typically begin. The objectives of this module are such and such. And there's an entire discipline around, you know, Bloom's taxonomy and the verbs you should use and all of that on what these objectives are. But in the new learning paradigm, the paradigm of environment, uh, it's more, well, I've put there serendipity or emergence. It's more the logic of discovery, right? You go into this field, you explore the field, you don't know what you're going to find ahead of time. And this is especially the case in the MOOCs that George and I created. Um, we said very explicitly, there isn't content we're going to cover. There isn't a common body of content we want everybody to remember. We'll talk about stuff. I mean, it's not like there will be no content in the course, but we don't expect you to remember it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's up to you. What we do expect, because the course is organized like a network, is that new knowledge will emerge, will be created by the dynamics within the course. And each person might experience it differently. And that will be what is learned in the course. So it's a different way of thinking about learning. It's, it's a way of thinking about learning where what it is that you're going to learn doesn't exist yet and won't exist until you finish the course. Uh-oh. 
Speaking of surprises, okay. They never told me there was a kill switch on this. So here's what I mean. That's our course. <laughs> Doesn't that look like a mess? That's how it started. And then once the students got into the mix, it got even more complicated and even messier. But you can see the nice ordered bit up at the top left there. That's the Moodle, because we used Moodle. But there's also the, the discussion list. There's uh, a wiki that we used. There's a blog that we used. Uh, there's uh, the, the Flickr tag and the Twitter tag, CCK08, etc. And we threw all of this at people on day one. And we said, go explore. And if you find anything that you think should be added to this, add it. And so our course began as this landscape that people explored rather than this content that people had to acquire. So why do it like this? Um, Right now, there's this whole movement in the field of instruction and learning technology around the concept of personalization. It's at once a good idea, but a bad idea. Where it's a good idea is in the sense that each person in a course has their own individual personal learning needs. Um, you've all gone to courses, I'm sure, where you already knew some of the stuff that they were covering. Now, wouldn't it be better if you could just skip that and get to the stuff you don't know? You've heard uh, maybe of different learning styles, or maybe you've heard of the arguments against learning styles who say, from people who say there's no such thing as a learning style. But you know you prefer to watch videos than read text. Or you know you like to start with details rather than theory. Who knows? Or even something as simple as, um, like me, you don't see so well, and really you need more audio and less video. Or like me, you don't know, wake up early in the morning, you prefer to start your course in the afternoon. You know what I mean? There's this idea that different people have different needs. That, to me, that's established fact. That, you know, that, that's probably as, as, as well understood as anything in education. So how do you deal with that? Well, Personalization, you notice how I'm emphasizing the word here, is you take a course, an off-the-shelf course, and then you adapt it to the individual. So the classic example of personalization is something called programmed learning. Programmed learning really is simply you have some content, and then you have an activity. And depending on the outcome of that, of that activity, you have some content or another content. The simplest example is a loop. You have an activity, then you do a test. If you fail the test, you go back to the content. If you pass the test, you go forward. So you keep going back, going back, going back until you pass. That's the simplest example. But programmed learning can be fairly complex. So, and the, a lot of this comes from the 1970s. And you'd have programmed learning textbooks. Now, a lot of the early video games uh, were, were structured in this way. Adventure games, for example, were set up in this way. People got bored of them. I got bored of programmed learning. And the problem is, with programmed learning, you don't really need to learn. 
All you need to do is understand how the program works. And so you get very good at programmed learning, not so good at learning. I used to watch kids, kids, I was a kid, and they were younger than me, therefore they were kids. Uh, when the early laser disc video games came out, I don't know how many of you remember them, or I don't know if you even had them here. But what, a, what the laser disc video games were, the laser discs were like this big, and they would contain little bits of movies. So it would be like you're watching a screen and you have a gun. And you shoot your gun. If you hit your target, one movie plays. If you miss your target, a different movie plays. And then you'd do something else, and it would show a little bit of a movie. A little bit, another thing, it show a little bit of a movie. Well, what they would, the players would do is they would memorize what you need to do to get to the end, completely independently of the content of those movies. It was all just remember the sequence of instructions. And that's what they began program learning. You missed it. I'm sorry. Now you'll never know. I'll read it in slides. <laughs> so, I'm not a fan of personalization. I'm a fan of personal learning. And here's how I set up the discussion. You have two ways of looking at things. Not coincidentally, the same two ways, the same two ways of looking at things as C MOOCs and X MOOCs. On the left, the X MOOC, the traditional, the content based, first you get some content, then you're given a test. On the right, on the other hand, is the approach that begins with practice, begins with trying to do something, and with the results of that practice being content. See the difference? So one is, you know, read first, then try. The other one's try first, then see what happens. I'm pretty much on that side. Well, pretty much. I, I'm almost completely on that side. You know, this is, you know, read the instructions, then try the computer program. Try the computer program, and then see what happens. So, you think about it. On the left hand side, there is some person, organization, or entity defining an ideal state of content awareness that you should have. Everyone must learn the fundamentals, let's say, or something like that. You, you must know basic algebra, or I don't know, whatever. As compared to, on the right-hand side, I would like to be able to fire a laser on my computer screen, or I would like to build a house, or I would like to make a pierogi without it becoming horrible, you know, I've made pierogies. It's not, not a pleasant sight. Now, because you boil them, right, and then if the potatoes are, you get like soup. <laughs> right. So, so you try the content, and then you do some practice, and that's known as a test. As compared to on the right hand side, you try something, you get the result, right? And that's a try or an attempt. The role of the instructor, because there's always instructors or whatever, is very different as well. On the left hand side, your teacher's main function is to test you. And that's why you're always asking the teacher, is this on the test? Because you know that that's what the teacher's main function is. As compared to on the right hand side, the main function of the teacher is to help you. May I have a comment on this? Is yes. This ideal slide to show when we start to talk about the desired school visit in the science center. 
This exactly on the left is a this person that tests you is a teacher. It's exactly on the right side of the pen is what I imagine is our explainer in the Copernicus Science yeah. Center. It helps you to try first to practice, then to content. That's the difference between school yeah. and the science center, as far as I can see it. Well, sure. At the moment, yeah. How, how, I wonder how popular Google would say you are if everybody had to pass, pass a test before they left the building. <laughs> you cannot leave until you pass the test. We have a research lab. They can settle up that kind of thing. <laughs> so, so interesting, interestingly, each iteration, because it's a loop, each iteration on the left is a correction. Your teachers are constantly correcting you. That's a really dysfunctional relationship to have with a person, right? But that's their job, right? You learn some content, they tell you where you've gone wrong. That's their function. On this side, each attempt to do something is an opportunity. Right? Each iteration is a chance to do it again and get it right, or, or to achieve your objective, or whatever. It's more forward looking. So In terms of learning design or instructional design, sorry, I did shave, but it sounds like I didn't. <laughs> uh, on the left-hand side, your instructional design is going to be based on requirements. Your curriculum is going to be based on requirements. The entire scope of your course and your program are going to be based on requirements. But on the right hand side, by contrast, the design is based on affordances. Now what do I mean by that? An affordance is a new capacity that you have that you did not have before. So if I'm just standing here and I have no tool, I have certain capacities. But if Lukas gives me a hammer, now I could do things that I could not do before. Like I could break this mug. I won't, but I could. Right, right now, if I hit this mug, I can't break it. But with a hammer, I can break it. That's an affordance. And when you think about what's involved in designing a hammer, most people will think about the requirements. What do you need a hammer for? Tell me what the use case is. Oh, you need to hammer a nail. Okay, we'll give you a thing that hammers nails. But I think of the affordances. A hammer is useful for hammering nails, but it also lets me hammer other things like mugs or Lucas's hat. Or this is called war hammer. <laughs> war hammer. <laughs> or I can use it to hold the door open so those people leaving don't have to push it on the way out. Or I can use it to create a competition. How far can you throw the hammer? You see all kinds of things that we didn't think about before we designed the hammer. This is to do with affordances. What we can do now that we couldn't do before, this is to do with requirements. What we do that we must do. This is use cases. This is possibility. And finally, the distinction. In personalized learning, the institution does all the work for you. It chooses what you're going to learn. It chooses how you're going to learn. It corrects you when you're wrong. It tells you to try again. As compared to, in the case of personal learning, you do the learning for yourself. 
You choose what it is you want to learn. You choose how you're going to learn it. You determine for yourself what counts as success. And you gain capacities that you couldn't have imagined before you started. So my preference is personal learning, defined like that, rather than personalized learning. I'm looking to build an environment that allows each person to define their own learning so that they can be autonomous as learners and so that overall there's a diversity of individual learning paths and individual learning outcomes. I'm not sure what's next, but I think it's, yeah. So this is a natural breakpoint. And again, we're going to find out if there are any questions. Um, again, okay. I've just, uh, uh, just we, we've been talked about success levels and the success rate. I've seen some picture, uh, some people taking pictures of your slides. This might be a sl slight remark that you're having success in sharing knowledge. Yeah. And these were educators photographing that. It's very interesting. And, and you notice, <laughs> I'm not worried by the fact that some people did not complete this lecture or this seminar. It's okay. It's cool. It's more common than the question. Um, looking at the slide, it seems that, my perspective at least, as far as education is concerned, this right side, these are the earliest years of our childhood, at the kindergarten or even very early school. And then there is some shift. I mean, like in the primary school or um, high school, uh, you have this left side. Mm -hmm. And then as adults, we do our best to come back to this right side. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and we really put a lot of effort in education to stay on this right side. For, for children, for young children, it's really natural. When we try to learn to walk or to, to speak, we really use this right side of our slide. And then it seems that we are forced a little bit to go on the left. So, um, yeah, so that's why I'm also thinking about the reasons why. So, um, about the standardization education. That's the term that comes to my mind yeah. when I'm thinking about this left side. Standardization. Trying to put everybody in one specific um, box. It, it, it's funny that you state it that way, and, and I do like the way you stated it, because um, when I talk about connectivism as a theory of learning, when I talk about autonomy and things like that, the first reaction that people very often have is to say that, but young children can't be trusted to learn on their own. All right, that's, I got it on Friday. I had people who insisted that, you know, it's very idealistic, but we could never allow young children to learn this way. But in fact, young people, young children do learn this way. What they don't want to do is that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we would have much less difficulty convincing them to learn if, if we did it more like that. Well, uh, I think this comment should be done by someone with a background in psychology, but I think the huge difference between these two is drive, is what makes us motivation, sure. what makes us learn. Now, obviously, young children have very active mind. they looking, actively looking for they don't need external motivation because they look for opportunities to do something, to learn something from my own practice, to break something into pieces, usually. Uh, but that's learning. That's usually learning. And uh, uh, the problem with Afro dancers is if the, if the person, uh, okay, if the parent can afford that. But that's not the other thing. Now, uh, 
but sometimes these, uh, I mean, at some moment when you grow up, this drive, this internal drive, a little dies a little bit, or it softens a little bit. Or but when chilling. you have, but when you have a test, when you have an exam, when you have, a, you know, you have to get to the university, to the department you like, to the studies you like, and that's the goal, mm -hmm. that's the stake, that's the external drive. And that's why we move to the left side, because school is about to get edu education. The test is not only you know, school-driven, but also people like tests or exams. They, they hate it, hate to take it, but they like to pass it, because then there's a paper that allows you to go out to society. And the trick is that we need another person on the left side, another person on the right side. On the right side, you need another person not only to help, but also to maintain a drive for learning, because you may not take a step from practice to content. And the question is, what happens then when your natural greed or natural hunger for learning, for playing, dies out? What happens then? Will we naturally move to the left? So, I am not of the view that it's been proven that your natural drive or your natural motivation dies out. I think we kill it. I think that what children or young people or even young adults don't want to do or things that you want them to do but that's different, right? I don't, you know, and this isn't just an educational argument. This is, this is a sociological argument as well. Um, because I, I hear this argument raised on behalf of any number of physicians. For example, um, in Canada we have a welfare system and we have a healthcare system. And the argument is made that people won't want to work and won't want to take care of themselves if they have too good a welfare system and too good a healthcare system. So you have to take these away so that they're forced to work. I'm not really a fan of that line of thinking. I think that if you took away the need, you know, uh, that's forced by starvation, let's say, that people would still be creative. It's just they wouldn't work at McDonald's. Who would, right? This model is a model designed to get people to work at McDonald's or to work at Ford or to work in an office. This is a model that gets people to work in what are more traditionally non-productive ways, like, well, I don't know, art, architecture, music, design, whatever. Interestingly, interestingly, the internet was built by people working on this side, not on that side. If people just did their jobs, we would have no internet. If your toilet breaks, who comes to fix it? People from the left side or from the right side? If my toilet breaks, I fix it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about other people, right? But having said that, I know people who like fixing things like toilets. They really do. But if the problem is that we have too many toilets breaking and not enough people fixing them, the way we normally do it is we motivate people to fix toilets, but what we really need are people who are smart enough to make better toilets that don't need fixing. And in fact, that's how we got the toilet we have. Thomas J. Crapper, that was his name, designed a system 
which had basically one moving part, the flapper in the crapper. And yes, it's really called a flapper. So that the natural movement of the water through the funnel would cause it to rush out and empty the toilet. Which is why your toilet almost never breaks, because the, the crapper flapper is really a dapper. Sorry, I just made that up. <laughs> but his name really was Crapper, and it really is called a flapper. Yeah, we all know his name in English. Yeah. Not the best way, but nevertheless. Any other questions <laughs> concerning sorry. toilets or any other topic at all? You're the one who brought up toilets. <laughs> As an example. Yeah. Any other questions? Now, concerning the time. How are we doing? Uh, we have 20 minutes left from the original time. So we may start a topic, a short one, and see if people would comment. So we got two choices. Yep. We could either stay on the personal learning environment or, even more interestingly, Oh, I, I could do the making and sharing thing, or we could talk about critical literacies, or we could do making and sharing, whatever you want. Making and sharing. Making and sharing? One vote, the others. Okay, let's vote. Critical literacies. Okay. Who's the fan of democracy? <laughs> it looks like the Critical literacies has won the elections of 2007. Well, you didn't even do the other two options. <laughs> but that's what it's the US style election. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have two options and you You have two options and one of them is unelectable. <laughs> I would say it's pretty much the Polish elections as well. <laughs> Sometimes both of them are unelectable. Okay. So let, let's do critical literacies. This, this is the glue um, that makes it all work. Because what do we do if we don't have content? How, how do we function at all? What are we up to as teachers and educators if we're not trying to make people memorize facts? What, for that matter, is all of that stuff in the other room with the wheels and the harp that doesn't have strings and all of that? What's that trying to do? You're not making people memorize how to build a harp without strings, right? I hope not. <laughs> it's critical literacy. Now, where did I start this? Right. Remember a few minutes ago I criticized the semantic web, because I said the problem is it's based on a model of language and knowledge completely based on text, on sentences, on propositions. And you know, and I know, that we use much more than text to know things and communicate things. Right off the bat, music. There is no place for music in the semantic web, except as a resource that some URL points to. Um, emotion, art, graffiti, shrugs, body language, playing with your cat, all kinds of things. Uh, if you look on the internet today, look at the many ways people communicate with each other. Sure, they use text. But they use video, they use images, they use images with video on them. And they say the silliest thing, they share cat pictures. And that's socially meaningful. So, there's all kinds of other kinds of communication. And all of these form a part of knowledge. Anyone remember that? Leave Brittany alone, <laughs> right? I can't quite give it justice. At the time I took this screenshot, yeah, I, I watched these things. <laughs> 25,558,000 views. 
obviously it had a message that spoke to people, right? But it's not language as we understand it. So we have to change our narrow conceptions. We have to change the conception like messages have a sender and a receiver. They don't. I have a radio station with zero listeners, no receiver. Words get meaning from what they represent. No. Lots of words, lots of signals get their meaning from context, get their meaning from socially understood convention. The whole leave Britney thing alone, yeah, it pointed to that guy, but it pointed to a much wider cultural phenomenon, didn't it? This idea that truth is based on the real world. We had a nice discussion about that earlier. Truth isn't based on the real world because many statements are true that don't exist in the real world. Brakeless trains are dangerous. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Are there trains without brakes? No, because they're dangerous. So here I have a true sentence that points to nothing in the world. How about science is based on forming and testing hypotheses? No, not anymore. Science is based on agreement, tacit agreement of language, whatever that language would be, tacit agreement on what counts as evidence, what counts as reasons, and tacit formation of a community of inquiry around the subject. That's what science is. That's what this planetarium is. It's part of the building of that community, part of its job. Didn't know that, right? Well, but you probably did. I'm probably not saying anything new. So what I did is I thought about this a lot rather more than is healthy for any person. And I decided we have gone beyond language in our understanding of communication, in our understanding of knowledge. And so we need to have something better than just rules of grammar or meanings of words or axioms of mathematics, principles of logic. There's got to be something more basic and more fundamental that underlies all literacies. Literacy in language, literacy in mathematics, digital literacies, which people are always talking about these days. These are the fundamental skills that are developed by working in networks and that are adapted for working in networks. These are the skills that allow you to be part of a perceiving, knowing, and sharing community. And I identified six. The names of which I've stolen the, from other people, obviously. Syntax, semantics, pragmatics, cognition, context, and change. Now, I don't mean any of these in the traditional narrow sense. But I'm using each of them to capture some of your common, already understood ways of knowing and ways of representing. So here's syntax, for example. Normally we think of syntax as rules. But syntax is not just rules. Syntax refers to any sort of regularity or commonality in the environment. It refers to structures, to patterns, to similarities. So here are some examples. It can refer to the form or the shape of the thing, an archetype in the Jungian sense. It can refer, it can refer to grammar rules or logical syntax, but these rules expressed as regularities, as patterns we observe in practice rather than principles we must follow. It refers to operations, procedures, how to drive a car. There's a, a common pattern to driving a car. If you want to turn right, you pull this hand down, assuming you're using this hand. Regularities, 
Substitutivity, there's a thing called egg corns in English. I don't know if there's a Polish analogy. Uh, an egg corn is where you use a word. It's not the right word, but it kind of makes sense in the context. Um, so I, I, I can't think of any English example that will translate really well. Um, in sailing, um, in sailing, you move back and forth against the wind by tacking. Is there a Polish word for that? Uh, I wouldn't say it's Polish, Halsowanie. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, sorry, sailing language in Polish is mostly German. Oh. <laughs> or Dutch, actually. Uh, okay, Halsowanie, okay. So, so there's a saying in English to take a new tack, right? Which means you're going this way against the wind, then you turn around and go back. Okay. Kind of the idiom of that, fetish wiatr w żagle, you know. But a lot of people say instead, Take a new tact. Tact is like tactic. There must be a, f a Polish word for tactic. Yeah, but it has nothing to do. Nothing. With it. it does work. But so you see this a lot on CNN, right? Uh, the president took a new tact today, right? It's not right. <laughs> it's 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 he's using tact instead of tack. But it kind of makes sense, right? It's a new tactic. Anyhow, that's an egg corner. English is there's hundreds of them. Um, we need a ling we need a linguist right now to, yeah. to find out, but we don't have to. Do we have anyone with linguistic background? Help us? No. I'm really. sure in Polish you have egg corns. <laughs> you must, you know. Um, anyhow. Uh, so, anyhow, um, so just a, a common understanding of patterns. I, I mentioned this example the other day. Have you ever watched Sesame Street? No? Yeah. Oh, no, know. it's obvious we still do. Still do. You, you know the thing, three of these things belong together, one of these things is not the same, one of these things is not like the other, can you pick? Do they still do that one? Yeah. Yeah. So they're trying to teach you syntax, but in a non-formal way. They're trying to teach you how to look at a phenomenon, whatever it is, all right, apple, peach, orange, egg, and see the pattern. It's an exercise in syntax is what they're trying to do, but a non-linguistic Prelinguistic, sublinguistic type of syntax. This is an essential skill. But it, you can't just teach it in class by teaching people rules. You have to become immersed in it and practice it. Second one is semantics. Now, semantics typically meant how do you define truth? And truth was originally defined by Tarski's principle. The sentence, snow is white, is true if and only if snow is white. True, but not useful. Um, in fact, truth and associated concepts such as meaning, purpose, goal, objective, value, these are all related to each other. They refer to refer to the attitude that we have towards something. And there's a skill in thinking about identifying and working with attitudes, right? If you look at somebody and like I'm looking at him and I'm judging, yes, he disapproves. <laughs> I'm just kidding, right? Maybe he does. I've been sitting here thinking, these are the people who agree. These are the critics. <laughs> uh, I've been having a lot of fun with that throughout the whole talk in my head. It's terrible. So there's a whole set of skills, right? If I said to you, 2 plus 2 equals 4, what does that mean? All right? Some of you might say, well, it has to do with objects in the world. Others might say, well, if you're betting, you use this principle to calculate your odds. 
Other people might say, well, of all of the objects that are possibly out there in the world, there are different ways of thinking what 2 plus 2 equals 4 actually means. There's the ways that we learn, the ways that networks are formed. These are elements of truth and values. Um, I just mentioned Friday, birds of a feather flock together. Well, how did that saying go in Polish? It's shorter in Polish than English. How about that? And does not include birds. And does not include birds. It's probably way shorter. That's a principle, or it's not really a principle, but it has something to do with meaning, truth, value, etc. Working with this is a type of skill. And again, you need to be immersed in a community that has a sense of truth, meaning, value, whatever it is, right? Because these, these are properties of assessment of states of affairs by communities of people. I haven't said it quite that way before. Third one is pragmatics. Use, impact, what you're going to do with what you know, or what you, what, what you know has done. Um, in language, there are things called speech acts, because we use language for much more than just to say things. We use language to do things. Like, for example, when I got married, I said, I do. I use language. I did something. Uh, you can use language, you know, and people who are proponents of freedom of speech often confuse this, right? They say, oh yeah, freedom of speech, that means you can say anything. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that you can do anything. And a lot of times the use of language is a use that is intended to do something rather than to say something. People who yell fire in a movie theater are attempting to get everybody to leave the movie theater. Uh, people who say, kill him in a crowd, aren't expressing an opinion. They're trying to do something. Uh, Wittgenstein famously said, meaning is use. The meaning of a word really is how we use the word. Pragmatics, the second or the third literacy. Understanding how we do things with our communications. Understanding how we use our communications to do things. Kind of makes sense, right? The fourth one is traditional logic. I put it all under the heading of cognition, and I've broken cognition down into four major areas. Most logic textbooks focus only on induction and deduction, which are types of argument, but there are four major areas of cognition, and if you read like John Stuart Mill or some of Frege or some of the originals, you see this, but there's description, how we describe the world, including with pictures, uh, leave Brittany alone is a descriptive act, right? Um, definition, Sometimes useful, sometimes an annoying pain in the neck. Um, and then argumentation, and then lastly, which is almost always ignored in logic classes, explanation. And which, of course, that's the business of science. Not argumentation. It's funny because, you know, you, you have people who are, are critics of science saying, prove this to me. Well, it's not the job that science is doing. Science doesn't care whether you believe it or not. Right? Science is in the business of explaining things. So, cognition is the fourth. Now we get into the fun ones. Context. One of our least well-developed skills is context. Understanding of context. Understanding of who we are, where we are, when we are, and how that shapes our understanding, our beliefs, what we can do, what we should do. Context plays a role in every aspect of thought. Uh, I've got there, it says explanation. 
right? So that's a classic example. It's been explored in the literature. Um, it's also the source of many jokes. When you're asking for an explanation, you're asking for an answer to a why question. Why is the sky blue? You want an explanation. Why are there roses in the garden? You want an explanation. But any request for an explanation assumes a context. And the context is what else could be possible rather than the thing you're talking about. Why is the sky blue as opposed to, say, green? Why are there roses in the garden? as opposed to, say, tulips. You, know, you can have a lot of fun with that. Why are there roses in the garden? Because Fred said so. Why are there roses in the garden? Well, it begins with the principle of chlorophyll. Why are there roses in the garden? Because cactuses won't grow there. But you see, there are many answers to a simple why question. So understanding context is about understanding possibility. It's about understanding the different ways the world could be as opposed to the way the world is now. People don't think of that. They don't think, you know, they, they say, you know, uh, why, why is the government doing that? Instead of, well, they don't get to the instead of. What else would they do? It's a classic phrase from the movies. What else would you have me do? That's a, that's a great tactic in argumentation as well. Somebody said, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Well, what would you rather I did instead? Sometimes there's no answer. George Lakoff is well known for defining context in terms of what he calls frames. And a frame is a linguistic construction that establishes the realm of possibility. What counts as evidence, what counts as reasons, and he argues that these are used in a political context. The difference between the left wing and the right wing in politics is a difference in frame. Each of them sees the world differently, different presumptions. The left wing, people are inherently good. The right wing, people are inherently bad. The left wing, people try to make their lives a success. The right wing, people are naturally lazy. Frames. There are just different ways of seeing the world, and you draw different constructions from them. Context. The last critical literacy is change. Oh, speaking of change, I didn't do the text on that one. Oh, well. So, change, and this is a nod to continentalism and European philosophy, and in particular Hegel. Um, I'm just kidding. Change is the understanding of the way things change. First of all, the fact that things will change. And then the different ways in which things can change. Uh, things can change in a linear fashion. Things can change in an exponential fashion. Moore's law, the uh, processing speed of computers will double every 18 months for half the price. That's a principle of change. But we also know, based on our understanding of change, it can't last forever. It can't continue to go up like that. A lot of people think that the world changes in waves. Things go one way, then they go the other way. Things go one way, then they go the other way. But again, if we're sensitive to change, we know that Sometimes they change, they go back and forth, and then they never go back again. That can happen too. It's an understanding of the way the world can be shaped. The I Ching is the Eastern philosophy of change. And it shows the linkage of change and relations between things. The yin and the yang are principles of opposition. But the I Ching is about how these balance through different configurations and different ways of movement in, in the world. So 
everything from simple scheduling to planning time to predicting a future, all of these are skills dealing with change. So I think of these as, well, not 20th century or 21st century skills. They're kind of like 21st century languages. They're kind of ways of looking at the capacity to do anything, any discipline, any practice, uh, any domain of inquiry will be informed by these six critical literacies. Henry Jenkins, for example, talks about the different literacies of performance, simulation, and appropriation. Now, these are very interesting categories, but I would say they each have their own characteristic syntax, pragmatics, etc. So here's something very simple. Uh, let's look at the syntax for performance. What is the syntax for performance? Before I made this slide, I knew nothing about the subject. I looked, did some digging around on the internet. There's all kinds of stuff, right? So. Uh, for performance, there are things like different kinds of acting, like method acting. Uh, things like, I didn't know this, Stanislavski system. Uh, that's a complete coincidence. I didn't know I was going to be in Poland when I wrote that slide. Uh, it was Russian as far as I know. Oh, and our expert on performance, what he has left, so it's pity for him because he would see something he liked. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, ritual performance in the whole, there's a whole domain of ritual performance, including the one where I said I do as an act. Um, comparing tales, it's, you know, but you see how this works, right? If we're trying to understand performance as a subject area, the way to go about understanding performance is to understand the syntax. And then we would look at what is the meaning and the value of performance, of different types of performance. How does a performance express truth? Can there be a false performance? Well, sure there can. There's lip syncing, milli vanilli. Um, somebody said Taylor Swift was just hanging out. Uh, yeah, you read that too, right? <laughs> Um, you know, what are the contexts of performance? How can you use a performance? In Hamlet, the play within a play is a classic illustration of how a performance can be used to unsettle somebody, in this case, the king, who was indeed unsettled. Um, and even the changes, changes within a performance, change in the nature of performance, change of what counts as performance. All of the different aspects that you can think of to think of performance itself as a domain of inquiry. This applies, I argue, to any domain. These indeed are the fundamental literacies. Okay, first of all, they are all going to kill me because I forgot when I introduced you to tell everyone that you are a philosopher as well. And it shows. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm pure. All I do is write yeah. software. I do else. <laughs> yeah, we all see that software. Yeah. Now, uh, any short comments? Because we are running out of time. Actually, we are out of time at the moment. We are even behind of time. Uh, no, it's not that much. Okay, it's a few minutes. So, any comments? Uh, the last bit was really interesting. I've got a few slides I'm going to print and put in front of my monitor. Uh, you have to say it was really interesting because you voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, just a question. I'm frustrated that all these interesting ideas will never become a part of the formal educational system. Yeah. Um, I have long since concluded that change in the educational system, particularly along these lines and some other change as well, will begin outside the system and only gradually be brought inside the system. And that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, it's the best way because you know we don't want to use the educational system as a place to do experimentation on children, uh, that would be a bad thing. So 
you know, it's okay if we don't immediately change the education system. I mean, they're doing that in the United States, and it, it really has been a bad idea. Um, they should allow this, this kind of thinking, these ways of learning, to develop outside the system, and gradually, gradually, they make their way inside the system. That's Gradual right. change for education system isn't uh, fashion in Poland, and it has never been before, as far as I can see. Yeah, I know, and I want to change it all overnight, too. But I've learned it's such a bad idea. Um, it's such a bad idea. Even if the system is better, after you've changed it, I mean, you, you can only change it against the will of people. And if you change the system against the will of people, it's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's better. Um, so, you know, you have to do it gradually. You have to, I mean, a change in something as society-wide as an educational system has to, in my view, involve the people who are involved in the system. Um, otherwise, it pits the system against the people. So, you know, I'd love to change things faster, but, you know, I, I think change happens slowly. We suggest to uh, somehow to uh, get the other bit of that sentence to listen and to see the talk of Professor uh, Bogdan Sivinsky, the closing talk of our conference, because that's a good coda for that, yeah. I would say, uh, is going to be available soon. So it's, yeah, it's really that perspective of the family of Sivinsky, because it's the whole family, has been brought to our. Uh, uh, to our uh, view by Professor Tsevinsky. That's, that's a good story that shows that the change takes time. So, thank you very much. Thank all of you. I, mean, I really appreciate you all staying for the Retention was pretty well. <laughs> And I've seen people who were walking away just because they had not, much, not enough time to stay here, not because they were bored or something. Yeah, especially even that person who was here for 10 minutes and left. Yeah, he, he had to go earlier. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. It's, yeah. it's uh, thank you very much once again for your coming to Poland, for giving that seminar. It was really seminal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Is it an echo? No, 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 you no, used both not. words correctly. Oh. So. <laughs> there is an egg corn, but but it's not restatable in public. <laughs> and my computer lasted the whole talk, so I'm going to close it now. It's probably because. But you weren't broadcasting. Yeah, it's probably why it lasted. It's going to be a viable later on. Yes. So, thank you for watching, and uh, sorry I didn't appear in the light, and I was just shadows, but I hope you enjoyed the talk, and uh, see you next time.